So uh, the way you estimate a confidence interval is uh, you ask the following question. So we had our one test set, and for that test set we had a 25% error. Now, in the future, we will get other test sets, right? Tomorrow, a bunch of emails are going to come in, and then, uh, and then the day after tomorrow, uh, another bunch of emails will come in. Right? So all of those are test sets, just like the one that we have today. Right? So if we look at the population of those possible future test sets, what is the range of errors that we can expect on test sets that look like this guy? Right? <clears throat> and by the way, um, so the, when I say the range, I really mean the confidence interval, not, not, not the range in the strict sense. So the range in the strict sense is the minimum and the maximum of the error, right? And, and, and what is the range? What is the true range? Zero and one. Yeah, zero and one, right? That's always the case because you could always get zero error. Today, you might be your lucky day. And the set of emails that comes in, your classifier will just get them perfectly. Or you could get a very, very unlucky day, and your test set will be unlike anything that you've seen before, so you'll get 100% error on those. Right? It happens uh, all the time. You can never guarantee what your maximum error would be. If, um, if you could, you wouldn't have had the financial crisis. <laughs> so the financial crisis happens when you set yourself a boundary Say, you know, I want a 95% confidence interval, and then a test set comes which is in that darn 5% that you didn't account for. Right. Um, so, uh, so you cannot do the range purely, but what you can do is you can try to construct an interval such that 95% or whatever number you pick, uh, P% percent of the future test sets will fall into that interval. And that interval is going to look like that. So it's going uh, to be some mean E, Right, the, the mean error rate, plus or minus some delta. Right? And the mean, we actually know where it's going to be. Right? We only have one test set at the moment. In the absence of other information, the error on that test set is our best estimate of the mean. We cannot estimate it better than that. So it's going to, be, it's going to look like that. It's going to be the testing error plus or minus some bracket. But how wide is that bracket? And we can actually compute that, right? So uh, think about what the testing error means. We said it's an unbiased estimate of E, and E is the true error rate of our system. Now, what is the true error rate? The true error rate, this is the true probability that our system will misclassify a randomly picked email from the future. Right? So <clears throat> that's what E is. Now, if I get a set of, um, uh, if I get a future, uh, test set, and it has n instances, and I know that E is my true error rate, how many instances would be misclassified in a set of n? So, you know, let's make it simple. Let's say that, let's say that E is 50%, right? Yeah, it's n times e. So uh, if your classifier is 50% accurate, and I give it a thousand examples, you would expect it to be accurate on 500 of them, and it'll make a mistake on another 500. Uh, now that's what you expect. That's your expected value of the error. But of course, the test sets can vary. You can get a lucky one, or you can get an unlucky one. But how do they vary? Uh, they actually vary according to a binomial, right? Now, to get this, you have to make some assumptions. You have to assume that the instances in your testing set are independent of each other. And that's an assumption that, uh, that uh, you make. It's, it's, it's hard to do anything without that assumption. So you have to assume that the emails don't depend on each other. Right. Now, if you do that, and E is the probability that you misclassify a randomly picked email, then you know that the distribution of errors will be binomial. Why? Because it's basically like coin tossing. You have a coin that comes up heads with probability E, and you're saying, I'm going to toss that coin 100 times. How many times is it going to come up heads? It won't, uh, even if your E is 50%, it won't always come up heads half the time. It'll have some, some noise around it, some variance, some distribution. And that distribution is 
the, uh, where is it, the binomial distribution. Its mean is going to be n times e, so how many, uh, how many items you have in the test set, times the probability of misclassifying it. So that's the mean. And the variance of a binomial is n times z times 1 minus e. That's just textbook definition. Okay. So that's the number of misclassified instances. Now what we want is the error on this test set. And the error is just the number of misclassified instances divided by the size of the testing set. So that is the uh, number of misclassified divided by n. That is, uh, that, what, uh, that is what our future error is going to be. Now n we know, because we know how many emails we're going to get tomorrow. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> We don't, uh, but misclassified is not a number. It's it's a random variable. It's a it's a binomial random variable. And um, once we divide it by n, we actually know that binomials are pretty well approximated by Gaussians. So we know that the future error rate is going to be a Gauss normally distributed, and it's going to have mean e, right? So that's n times e divided by n. You get e as the mean. Um, and the variance is going to be that, right? So uh, you have e one minus c divided by uh, <coughs> divided by n, because uh, when you divide a random variable by uh, by n, the variance gets changed by n squared, right? So we had uh, we divide this by n squared, so this n cancels out, and we get one n that comes in the denominator. Um, so this is what our future errors will be distributed like. It'll be a normal, uh, it'll be a Gaussian distribution with this mean and this uh, variance. Now, what does it tell us? What does it tell us about what we want to know? We want to know the confidence interval. Well, we don't quite have a confidence interval, but we already know something, right? We have a Gaussian um, with a certain mean, with a certain variance. And one thing that we know about Gaussian is if you take the mean, and you take all the points sort of one standard deviation away from the mean, then about two-thirds of the mass is going to be in that region. So what we can say already is two-thirds of future test set will have an error in the region of E, the mean, plus or minus a standard deviation. This is just the square root of the variance. Right. So if you take one standard deviation to the left and to the right, you will capture two-thirds of future test sets that you expect to see. <clears throat> okay, now uh, we don't want two-thirds. Two-thirds, this means that we have a 66% you know, confidence interval. What if we want higher confidence? The way to generalize it is really pretty simple. So um, we, have this, um, we have this form, and let me just uh, drop everything. So, um, it's still going to be e plus or minus the standard deviation, only now we need to decide how many standard deviations we need to take to the left and to the right. right? So if we take one standard deviation, we know that we'll get 67%, right? uh, that, or somewhere around there. That will be our confidence interval. So how many standard deviations do we need to, to take to get, uh, to get, say, 95%? Right? And we can compute that. Uh, using that. So that is the inverse of the Gaussian's cumulative distribution function. So if you're not sure, uh, if, if you're not sure what it is, uh, so uh, this is the Gaussian with mean e. Right. The, distrib uh, the cumulative distribution function is basically you take a certain value of x and it's the area to the left, right? And if you you can plot this area as a function of x, and if you did that, it would look kind of like, uh, so this would be our e. It will look kind of like that. So that, that's just the area to the left um, under the curve. Right? So our x could be somewhere in here. Um, so that's the distribution function. This is 0, uh, this is 1. It never hits 0. Right? To get a 0, you need, you need to be at negative infinity. It never hits 1 either. Um, you need positive infinity. But it does, it does hit the numbers in between 0 and 1. So um, now what we're doing here is we're saying, uh, let's say we need a 95% confidence interval. So what does it mean? This means that. Around the middle, 
So we need to position the boundaries on the right and on the left in such a way that inside we're going to have 95% of the mass. 95% of future test sets are going to fall uh, in this region. This means that on the outside we're going to have 5% remaining. Right? And because, because Gaussian is symmetric, this means uh, we'll have 2.5% uh, on the left and 2.5% on the right. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking 1 minus p, so p was 0.95, 1 minus that is 5%, and we're splitting it by 2 to get 2.5%. And then we're asking the question, uh, to get 2.5, to get 2.5% of the area, how far to the left from the mean do we have to go? And then we're going to take that, and that is going to be our delta that we're going to, uh, we're going to take the delta and add it to the right and to the left. So that on the left side you'll have 2.5% uh, uh, outside of your interval, and on the right you'll have 25 So overall you'll have 5% outside. <coughs> uh, and uh, this is just a function, so you can compute this via the inverse error function, which is uh, available in lots and lots of... Uh, Packages. It's actually pretty simple to pretty simple to compute. Okay. So for so for some specific examples. Uh, so for our example, with a hundred examples, uh, we want ninety five percent confidence interval, and our error, our best estimate of the true error is 0.25. So <clears throat> it turns out that to get ninety five percent of the mass, you need almost two standard deviations to the left and to the right. Right? So, uh, so you need 1.96. So your confidence interval is going to be me the mean plus or minus almost two standard deviations. And what's the standard deviation? Well, that's our formula for the variance, so we just take the square root of it. Right? So uh, E is 0.25, 1 minus E is 0.75, and we divide by N, which is 100 in our case, take the square root of that. So uh, our standard deviation is 0.04. <coughs> 43, so the confidence interval, the final confidence interval, is 25% plus or minus 8%. So what this means is that if this was our testing set, then on the future testing sets, assuming that we sampled in an unbiased way, assuming that our testing set is somehow representative of what we'll see in the future, we will see the error, which is somewhere between uh, 18, uh, no, what is it, yeah, 17% and 33%. Uh, so somewhere in that bracket there will be 95% uh, of the future test sets. So now what if we want a tighter interval, right? What if we want to, what, what if we want to avoid the financial crisis and we want to make sure that we account for all possible things uh, in the future? This just means that we need to take our P and move it up. Right? So if we set our p to 99, this would be 99% confident. So 99 out of a future 100 uh, test sets would fall into the range. Uh, you have the same mean, but then uh, your p would change the numbers here. Right? So, oh, no, sorry. It's, it's actually right there. You would need more standard deviations to account for that. Uh, so uh, you need 0.11, right? So that broadens your confidence interval. You're more confident, but the interval is broadened. Um, what if you wanted to be 100% confident? How many standard deviations do you need to be 100% confident? Infinite, right? Why? Because under Gaussian, if you want to capture 100% of the mass, you have to integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity. There's no other way. So if you wanted to be 100% confident, you get a confidence interval that is useless. Because it'll say from minus infinity to plus infinity, no matter what your standard deviation is. Right? So you can never be 100% confident. But you can get close to it. Um, OK, so here's another useful, useful example. Uh, same thing, you, we have the same confidence level, 95%, but now suppose that we have 100 times as much data. So instead of 100 examples, we have um, 10,000 examples. How, how does this affect our confidence interval? How does this affect our estimate of where the errors are going to be? Um, 
it's going to shrink it. And you can actually get a very good sense for how well it shrinks it. Right? The only thing that depends on n is this thing right there. right? It's our standard deviation. And the way it depends, you can actually take this n and factor it out. So you have a square root of n. Right? So if you have 100 times as much testing instances, how much smaller is going to be your standard deviation? 10 times, because it's the square root of 100. So if you go from 100 to 10,000 instances, your bracket goes from 0.08 to 0.008. That's why you can never have enough data. Right? Having lots and lots of data allows you to compute tight confidence intervals and allows you to make good predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Assuming, of course, what happens in the future is represent uh, what, what's happening today is somehow representative of what's happening in the future. That's, that's the big assumption behind, behind this whole thing. <clears throat> uh, but this should just give you an idea for how, um, for how the confidence interval for the error depends on the number of instances that you have and on the confidence that you want out of that. So this is a way to guess how well it'll do tomorrow.